What is going on everybody and welcome to the 33rd machine learning tutorial as well as the final tutorial in the support vector machine section. And so what we're going to be talking about is one more concept and then we're going to kind of do a bit of a review which actually is going to cover a few more concepts but also kind of bring you up to speed with like the state of the art of how people are actually doing support vector machines these days. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started and we're going to first talk about classifying when you have more than two groups to classify into. So we're head over to my awesome artwork here. And you have two types generally that you're going to use or two methodologies that you might use when you have more than one or more than two groups that you're going to classify into. So the support vector machine is simply a binary classifier so it can only separate two groups basically at a time or per decision boundary. So the two methods you have is OVR which is one verse rest. So that would be one group versus the rest of the groups. And then you've got OVO, which is one versus one. So let's go ahead and depict those. And first I'm gonna start with OVR, which is just one versus rest. So let's start with group number one here. So if it's not totally obvious, I just have feature sets. Each class is denoted by a number and a color and uh, their feature sets being graphed out into vector space here. So let's start with the ones. What with one verse rest, what's happening is you're basically saying, okay, I want to separate ones versus the rest of the data. So we're actually separating the ones from the twos and threes. So we're going to have probably something like, uh, probably this is a support vector and this is a support vector. So I don't know, something probably around this would be your separating hyperplane. Okay. So that's the ones from the rest. And in fact, let me get rid of those because this is going to get kind of messy, so. Okay, so that's the ones from the rest. Now you're going to have the twos from the rest. And again, that's going to be, you know, you're probably going to have like this as a, a support vector. This is one, this is one. So this separating hyperplane might be something like this. And then you're going to have the threes versus the rest. And that's a, you know, something like this. Okay. So now you've got all your separating hyperplanes. Now, what's one of the problems with one verse rest? Well, it has to do with a, a sort of weighting issue. And that is that when you have basically in this case, let's say you've got, this is a very balanced data set. We've got three groups that we're trying to classify and each group has four samples in it. So it's, they're all equally balanced, but each dis, uh, separating hyperplane is a little imbalanced because you've got threes versus eight. So you got four data points over here, but on this side, you actually have eight total data points. So that can be a little more challenging uh, to kind of figure out which is which. Now, uh, the next thing though, is with one versus rest, or one versus one rather. So let me clear this up. And one versus rest is generally the, the default that you're gonna use. Uh, but you really, you're going to see people that use either one, but now let's cover one verse one. So one verse one, what it's going to do is it's going to have a separating hyperplane between each group. So it's going to be one versus twos and one versus threes. So let's do a hyperplane for the one versus twos. So it's probably going to be like this. And then you're going to have another hyperplane that separates the ones from the threes. So it's going to be like this. And then you're going to do the same thing. It's going to be twos versus ones. Well, we've already got that hyperplane. Twos versus threes. Okay, we'll do this. Great. Then again, we go to the threes. We say threes versus ones. Well, we already have that hyperplane too. And then the threes versus the twos. Turns out we already have that hyperplane as well. So then when you have a data point, you might have something like uh, this. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a question mark. Trust me. So you've got, you've got a data point over here and it's really unknown at this point. And the question is, well, it's on this side of the, the hyperplane. So it might actually be, you know, a two, right? It's on that, that separating hyperplane between the ones and the twos. So it might be a two, but then we get there and we're like, hmm, well, what about twos versus threes? Well, it turns out it's on this side of the hyperplane there. So it's probably a two. Okay. And so you can do stuff like that. And this one's a little more complicated than one versus rest. Because one versus rest, as soon as you find out which side of which hyperplane it's on, you pretty much have your answer. But even then, you're going to have cases where you've got to have, it's going to have to kind of go through this chain where it's definitely not a one, but it could be a two or a three or something like that. So anyways, most of the time you're going to do a one versus rest 
uh, but one versus one is still valid as well. It usually is a little bit more processing to do one versus one, but it's more balanced. Uh, so if one versus rest is not working out for you, you can check out one versus all uh, and just kind of see. Okay, so those are the separating, um, you know, basically one more concept that we had to draw out basically, but um, how, to, how to work with more than two classes uh, if, you, if you have them. And, and most or many real world cases are gonna have more than two classes. So you, you might as well figure it out. And really the support vector machine really came back. This most recent rise was due to character recognition. So, you know, you might have, you at least got, you know, zero through nine, so 10, 10 numbers, or you might even have like 26 letters in the alphabet times two for the casing and all that. So anyway, obviously we need the support vector machine to be able to, to classify more than two groups. So moving over, I'm going to bring up the SVM documentation. So this is just, if you Google SVM.SVC, you can get here. You can also just kind of follow along as I run through this. So uh, I'm gonna run through each of the parameters and then we'll talk about attributes really briefly at the very end of that. But uh, I'm gonna come down here and run through them in this order. So the first parameter here is C. So this should tell you right out of the gate. I mean, it says it right here and also in the first sentence, but this is a soft margin classifier. If you want a soft margin classifier to be hard margined, you can do that, right? You can, you can increase or decrease C however you want, right? And we already kind of explained how that would affect. And just for the record, let me pop back over to our, um, our tutorial where we talked about C, right? So that C is this C here, right? So how important is the impact of the slacks or the errors or the violations or whatever you want to call them? How important is that? And that's kind of what C does is it impacts that. Uh, value in that entire minimization function. As you minimize C, it means the errors matter, you know, less. So that's C. Then you've got uh, kernel, and kernel is kind of what we're, we've been talking about in the previous tutorials, and the default is RBF, or radial basis function, but you can also put poly in there for polynomial. You can put in the linear kernel, so just a straight up linear kernel if you wanted. You can have sigmoid pre-computed, or even a callable, and you, so you can have custom kernels should you desire to go down that route. Degree, this is just basically for that, yeah, the polynomial kernel. What what kind of power do you want to raise that kernel to? Gamma, don't touch it. It's just, it's that gamma value and RBF and all that. And if you want to mess with it, go for it. I would leave it as auto and it even tells you that's just going to be one divided by the number of your features. If you want to mess with it, you know, go ahead. But I would highly suggest you learn more about radial basis functions before you go messing with that. Coefficient zero, this is that independent term in your kernel function. Again, I would just leave that as zero, uh, but you can mess with that if you want. Probability, so this is kind of where we first remember we were talking about the K nearest neighbors algorithm. And one of its cool features is that not only can you have a total, uh, total model accuracy, you can also have a degree of confidence in whatever vote that you, you might cast. The support vector machine doesn't inherently have something like that, but it can be done. So we can do probability estimates. If you did want to check that out, um, you can come down to the scores and probabilities and you can learn more about how they're actually implementing uh, cross validation to figure out what the probability score of any prediction might be. You do have to call that prior to training, if I recall, somewhere on here. Oh yeah, yeah, so prior to fit rather. Um, but training. So, so just keep that in mind, but you, you can do it. It's just going to cost you a lot. And again, the, the real only downside to the support vector machine is that that large size data set is just going to perform poorly on the SVM. Bringing us to our next topic, which is shrinking, whether or not to use a shrinking heuristic. The default is true. So shrinking, if you recall where we were talking about SMO or sequential minimal optimization, and that was that uh, we pulled up that paper by John Platt from Microsoft many years ago, like over a decade ago, if I recall, I think it was like 2004 or something. Anyway, pulled up that paper. I could be totally wrong on the date, sorry. Anyway, the shrinking is involved with sequential minimal optimization. So if you, it's, it's just on by default and you honestly should leave it on there because it's gonna, things are gonna run much quicker. And the way that it does it is it basically decides which feature sets can basically just be like ignored from the optimization algorithm uh, because they're deemed to probably not have any impact. Next, we get to tolerance. 
So if you remember when we did the optimization, how I was, how we we're, the question was, okay, how do we know when we have actually found, um, first, how did we, how would we know that we've been, we've actually reached optimization? So uh, in fact, let's see if I can bring that up. So this was our code, I guess from 28 was the end of it. And if we scroll on down basically to, here was our requirement, right? We were saying um, if, if we found that all of our data was basically where you had y sub i multiplied by x sub i times w or w dotted with x sub i plus b, if everything was greater than or equal to one, great. But then remember how it's telling you what, what you can do before you go optimize down another smaller step like here. What you could do is you could find out, you could query, do we have, does both, do both classes have feature sets that when when run through this, um, basically, or basically when we printed it out, do both classes have feature sets? I uh, can't remember if we did it. Yeah, we did it down here at least. Uh, that where that value is very close to one or even equal to one, but it's very unlikely that you're ever going to reach a perfect one. Now with the support vector machine, generally you're going to actually throw in that minus one value. So um, so it's actually going to be more like y sub i times x sub i dotted with w plus b minus one is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, it could go either way, uh, but in the support vector machine with scikit-learn, uh, it's using the, the, the equation of y sub i x i w plus b minus one greater than or equal to zero. So that tolerance value, that tolerance value is where it's gonna check to see if both sides have a value that is either one e to the negative or one to the basically negative, so like 0 0.001 okay uh if both sides have a value of that or less it's going to say yep we've we found our optimal numbers and we can move on so you can you can edit this like if you wanted even more optimized you could make that rather than three eight or something like that but this is more than fine next you have cache size this is just to the size of that kernel. If you remember when we were showing the kernel in uh, using, I'm pretty sure it was the, pre right, the previous tutorial, uh, that gram matrix kernel that becomes your, or a gram matrix kind of, that has all that data that we're running through the kernel, uh, that can obviously on a large data set get pretty large. So you can, you can limit the size there, but I probably, wouldn't <laughs> unless you had a huge data set but yeah you can run into issues if you're going to decide to do something like that and you've got class weight i would probably just leave this alone but obviously you're going to have um you might have classes that shouldn't be weighted the same there's there could be a time where that happens uh, but and if that is you can you can modify that uh, verbose i wouldn't touch that because you're you hopefully are working in a multi-threaded context if you need it so i wouldn't worry about that Max iterations, this is another kind of, like going back to our tutorial here, our max iterations were what? Let me find them. Right. Here, right? We had three max iterations basically, because this is gonna go through here, here, and then here, and that's it. That's as many calculations as gonna, it's gonna run this, and then however many, so it's like, th actually it's more, that's not how many iterations we run. We're actually running quite a few more iterations than that. So an iteration I suppose would be maybe I guess it'd be the while loop I don't know anyway probably for the four steps and step sizes would be so for however many for loops actually ran you would have maybe that I don't know anyway because uh, these are the step sizes and then it's like so each of these would be three times while not optimized however many steps we might take so anyway you could remember if I was I was telling you with tolerance each time you decided you hadn't reached that tolerance you could take smaller steps right so you could take smaller steps but that process could go on till infinity because actually finding a time where you actually are you have both your data sets have a value that's equal to zero on both sides for those support vectors is just unlikely to occur i mean it might occur but it's very unlikely and so uh you have tolerance to, to kind of say okay if it gets you know beyond this 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 value then okay we're done but then also maybe you don't reach that maybe you're trying to do a hard margin on something that ought to be soft margin you might actually never reach the, those values therefore you can set max iterations to say okay we're going to only run basically this question here for i and self data you know we're only going to do this 
a million times. After that, we're going to be like, okay, we are done. <laughs> okay, so, so you can do something like that, but the default is actually there is no limit, uh, but you can set one if you want. Decision function shape, one verse one, one verse rest, okay, or none. The default is none, and pay attention. There's a couple of changes down here, noon version 0.17, Decision function shape OVR is recommended that that's the one that you use. Deprecated, decision function OVO and none are being deprecated. And then apparently the default of none will currently behave as OVO, but it raised deprecation warning, but will change to, I think they're saying this is gonna change to OVR in 0.18, but yet they're saying they're deprecating none. So, I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but I'm pretty sure the default will just simply be OVR. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that's what I'm reading, but uh, yeah. Anyway, then random state, this is just for a random seed if you want it, if you're doing that probability estimation. Um, I don't know if I really said it, but uh, the, the probability estimates are going to cause a really heavy load on your processing. So unless your data set is relatively small, like we've been working with very small data sets. So it really probably doesn't matter to use probability, but just understand that doing that on a large realistic data set is going to likely be hard. And then we come down to attributes. This was mostly, I mean, you can check, like, for example, the number of support vectors. So again, if you've got, you know, let's say you've got 500 total samples and you've got 400 support vectors with your soft margin classifier with the RBF kernel, that's, that's not very good, right? You don't want that. So it's always a good idea to kind of check the number of support vectors and compare that to the number of samples. Also, you can get the locations of your support vectors and you can get the things like W and B. And why might you want W and B? Well, if you want to visualize it, right? And same with the support vectors, you could grab those to actually visualize the data set uh, with matplotlib or something like that. So that should be everything. Uh, if you do have questions, comments, concerns, whatever, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, we're going to be moving on into flat and hierarchical clustering, and then after that, neural networks and deep learning and all that really fun stuff. So anyways, uh, questions, comments, leave them below. Otherwise, until next time.